Stephen is actually in Australia. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, Pia Marie Robital will actually be telling us about uh, Eddington Mass and Manassi relationship. All right. So uh, Stephen and I have been collaborating for a number of years. So I've been working on the idea that the sun is not a gas, that it's actually comprised of condensed matter. So of course we've thought that the sun has been a gas actually since 1864. In the beginning of the 20th century there was actually some discussion of whether or not the sun was a gas. There were two ideas, one by James Jeans that it was a liquid and uh, one by Eddington, the proponent of the gas model. And Eddington came up with the mass luminosity relationship and when he did uh, that solidified the idea that the sun was a gaseous plasma eventually and still today we think of the sun as a gas. Of course all the physical evidence is that the sun is not, it must be condensed matter and uh, you can study that in, in some of my papers. But today I'm going to talk about this central proof that, that the sun was a gas. Now, now we can start before this uh, if you think about how the sun is supposed to be formed currently in astronomy that we have a cloud that is collapsing upon itself to form a star and I'll highlight that that's actually a violation of, of uh, the laws of thermodynamics what happens is if you use the virial theorem to collapse a cloud and form a star the, you, you are doing work on the system and increasing its own temperature so that the system is doing work upon itself and increasing its temperature, that's a first law violation. And the other problem is that it's a second law violation, that now a system does work upon itself, it decreases its own entropy, and that's a second law violation. So a gaseous object cannot self-collapse, even though astronomy has been trying to argue, using the virial theorem, that it can. And part of the problem that happens is that you end up getting non-intensive temperatures a violation of the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Of course, if you look at the HR diagram, uh, you see the main sequence of the stars there in the center, and astronomy tells us that these stars, the ones that are in the main sequence from upper left to lower right, they all are powered by hydrogen reactions in their core, and I'm saying no, this diagram actually has nothing to do with nuclear reactions, that the stars that are in the main sequence all share the same lattice as the sun. I'm saying that the sun has a hexagonal planar lattice and that the stars, the photosphere has a hexagonal planar lattice and that the stars that are in the main sequence share that lattice. And the stars that are like the white dwarfs in the lower left, they are less luminous as we know and the reason that they are is that they have a different lattice structure, not because they're more dense and therefore more luminous, less luminous. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, white dwarfs, uh, the idea is in the gas model, uh, the luminosity is down, so the only way you can account for that is to lower the radius, so they make these stars hyper dense. And what I'm saying is no, this is just like the wedding ring on my wife's, the, the diamond on my wife's ring. Uh, it has a different crystal structure than graphite, therefore it's transparent, and whereas graphite is a gr great emitter, so if you have a different crystal structure, you're going to get different luminosity. So what I'm saying is that the HR diagram is when we're considering luminosity, we should be thinking about lattice structure. And I'm saying that the stars do have a lattice. Now, if you look at this famous plot by Eddington uh, in the mass luminosity relationship, which he published in 1924. So Eddington derived a mathematical relationship between the mass and luminosity of the stars which was based on ideal gases in hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, there was only one additional requirement, namely that the resulting line must pass through the mass and luminosity values for the star Capella. Actually, he wanted all the stars to have the opacity of the star Capella. And if he didn't do that, the plot could actually be anywhere on this. The line, Eddington's line, would be anywhere on this plot. Uh, the other thing that he required, and we can look at um, his equation here that he derives, there's a term there, beta, and that's a pure number relating gas pressure to radiation pressure. So he's got two things that he can play with, and with these two things he can put the line anywhere he wants because he can play with beta and he can play with uh, k sub naught, so, which is the opacity which he 
then put uh, equal to uh, the opacity of Capella. Jeans actually argued that this was a cheap mathematical trick, that Eddington had proved nothing. He argued that there is no general relationship between the masses and luminosity of the stars. And if you look at the history of astronomy in the 1920s, Jeans and Eddington actually had quite <laughs> a vigorous debate. And it's an interesting time in astronomy. And of course, Jeans was fighting for liquid stars, and Eddington was fighting for gaseous stars. And Jeans had the idea that the stars were powered by atoms like radium or uranium that were decomposing. And that was giving him his liquid stars. And of course, when the sun was really uh, identified to be made of hydrogen, he didn't have a building block, so he abandoned liquid stars later in his career. So if he had been careful, Wigner and Huntington in 1935 came up with the idea that when pressurized at high temperatures and pressures, hydrogen becomes metallic. And if he would have seen that paper, of course, Wigner was a Nobel Prize winner. If he had seen that paper, he would have realized that, yes, we can have liquid stars. This is a quote from Milnes, who wrote a textbook on genes, on the life of James Jeans. I can just read it. No words are needed to praise Eddington's achievement in calculating the state of equilibrium of a given mass of gas and in calculating the role of radiation from its surface. What was wrong was Eddington's failure to realize exactly his achievements. He had found that a condition for a star to be gaseous throughout by comparison with the star Capella, he had evaluated the opacity and the boundary layers, and he had made it appear unlikely that the stars in, in nature were gases throughout. His claims were to the contrary. He claimed to have calculated the luminosity of the existing stars. He claimed to show that they were gaseous throughout. He claimed to have evaluated the internal opacity of the stars. James Jeans deserves great credit for being the first critic to be skeptical about these claims of Eddington's theory in spite of the attractive plausibility with which the theory was expounded. I think that even today there is much misconception amongst astronomers about the status of Eddington's theory. So in Eddington's theory, there's actually a problem, and it's a thermodynamic problem. And we'll review the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which you all know. Uh, of course, the zeroth law says that if A and B are in equilibrium, B and C are in equilibrium, then A and C must be in equilibrium. But the law also implies that temperature is an intensive property. This is extremely important. When we do th thermodynamics, temperature is always intensive. We have to be able to measure it at every point. If you have a non-intensive temperature, then you're outside of the realm of the bounds of thermodynamics, and basically you're not doing physics anymore. The temperature of an object, object cannot depend on extensive properties, which in combination do not yield an intensive property. So you remember that the intensive properties are temperature, pressure, density, concentration, specific volume, and for large enough objects, color, of course. Mass, uh, the extensive properties are mass, energy, enthalpy, entropy, volume, and heat capacity. The concept of intensive and extensive properties is so important to thermodynamics that, that Landsberg, who was a notable figure in thermodynamics, wanted to establish it as the fourth law of thermodynamics. So what is the, basically that intensive and extensive properties exist, and they guide our understanding of thermodynamics. Now remember that in physics, when we balance an equation, normally we check for units, right? If we've got kilograms on the left, we want kilograms on the right. But in thermodynamics, it's more than that. It's not just a matter of checking for units. It's important to check for thermodynamic balance. If one side of an equation is extensive or intensive, then so must be the other side. So if you look at the Stefan Boltzmann's law as an example, it turns out that it's a balanced equation. So if you look at constants, epsilon, sigma, uh, don't uh, affect thermodynamic balance. So you could just discount them. And temperature is, must always be intensive. So what we say is L and A are homogeneous functions of degree 2 thirds. And as a result, if you divide L by A, you get a value which is intensive. So L divided by A here will be intensive on the left, and it's going to be the temperature will be the only thing that dis determines the balance of the equation on the right is temperature, and it's intensive. So therefore, the Stefan Boltzmann's law is balanced. And I wrote a paper with Steve uh, 
on intensive and extensive properties and thermodynamics. It, I believe that for people it would be great reading for you to understand a very important point in thermodynamics. Now if you look at Eddington's equation, he's got an expression for luminosity. So let's go ahead and put the Stefan Boltzmann's law there. So I've, I've now divided L by A, the area from which the radiation is coming, and I took it out of the Stefan Boltzmann's law and I divided everything through. And you get this central term here, and that central term is actually what what's Eddington is presenting for us. So L over A, I just told you, is intensive, and epsilon sigma t to the fourth is also intensive because the constants don't contribute and the temperature is intensive. So in the center there, the problem is that mass is extensive, okay? So it's a homogeneous function of degree one. But R squared is not extensive. It's a homogeneous function of degree 2 thirds. So that means that Eddington's expression here is a, is a function of degree 1 third. And that's a violation of thermodynamics because he's making that equal to temperature. So he's got a non-intensive term. The central part here needs to be intensive, and it's not. So this is a violation of thermodynamics. So what does it mean? the stars cannot be treated as ideal gases, okay? So Eddington was not correct. And if you try to see, stay, save the mass luminosity relationship, what you have to try to do now is to discount thermodynamics, which we will not do. We're going to keep the zeroth law. So unfortunately, that relationship is invalid. The stars must be condensed matter. And I've argued this for a while now, and you could read this paper 40 lines of evidence that the sun is condensed matter. And so the sun must have a true lattice. And uh, so we, if you look at the astronomers, they say that we get the emissivity of the sun, the, the luminous, uh, the light coming from the sun, the thermal spectrum from the sun, uh, comes from the sum of many processes which have nothing to do with thermal emission, right? So if you look at the Planckian curve, Okay, when you look at a thermal spectrum, what produces that on Earth? How do we get a black body spectrum on Earth? Well, you get it from something like graphite. Initial black bodies in the days of Kirchhoff, they were made from graphite, right? And graphite has it as its, at its disposal only one means of producing a thermal spectrum, right? The vibrations of its nuclei in its lattice. So you get a, you get a thermal spectrum when you have a vibrating nuclei that produces the photons, okay? If you don't have that, you cannot get a thermal spectrum. So what the astronomers have done is they have taken, for the sun, they have said, okay, we get a thermal spectrum. How are we going to get it? We're going to take the sum of many processes that have nothing to do with thermal spectra. We'll sum them to produce our thermal spectrum. And what I'm saying is no. The sun has a vibrational lattice. It's metallic hydrogen. And that metallic hydrogen is producing the thermal spectrum of the sun. So I've advanced that this is the central proof that the sun is indeed condensed matter. So how this talk is related is that the, the stars cannot be gases. They must be condensed matter. They have lattices. So I'm trying to have a fundamental change here in astronomy. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? So are you proposing, you know, the, all the layers inside the sun, the core, and all yes. the layers, the uh, yes. convection, whatever, are you proposing the mid, the core, is the lattice? So yes, I'm saying that, so the core of the sun has a solid body rotation at 430 nanohertz. So it's rotating as a solid body. We know this. So how can a gas do that, right? So I'm saying that the core, and actually Ishimuru, which is a, a Japanese uh, plasma physicist, he actually said that the core, that the, that the core of the sun was uh, body-centered metallic hydrogen, body-centered cubic metallic hydrogen. So I'm saying, now he still wanted a very high density. And I'm saying, no, the sun has pretty much a uniform density throughout. 1.4 grams per centimeter cubed, but the center of the, the sun, because of its pressure, has the most stable lattice, which is the body-centered cubic. 
So, so in the outside of the sun, we have the hexagonal planar lattice on the photosphere, and then as you come down, that, that, uh, that lattice gets slightly compressed and it gets more metallic. So when you look at the sunspots, they're, they're deeper in the sun, so that layer has been compressed more. It's highly more metallic. Uh, it goes more conductive, so what happens is now you see greater magnetic field strengths like in the umbra of the sunspots. And what I'm saying is that the sunspots are actually not cooler like astronomy teaches. It's an emissivity problem. The sunspots have a lower emissivity at the normal because they're more metallic. So we know that in metals, metals have a lower normal emissivity, whereas if you look at a non-metal, it has a high normal emissivity. So for a non-metal, the emissivity drops as you go in angle, as you move away from the normal. And when you look at the sun, you know that you have limb darkening. When you look at the sun, it's bright at the center and it drops at the side. So that is cons that's consistent with the idea that you have a lattice that's non-metallic on the photosphere, but as you go down into the sun and you see the sunspots, they are metallic, and that's why they, look, they appear dark to us. Okay? Any other questions? How does a condensed matter model um, explain stellar depth? Stellar what? Death? Yeah. Death? So if you look at something like a nova, why does a star go nova? So if you, for, for, as an example, okay, so I'm saying the stars are essentially incompressible, and that's an idea that uh, James Jeans advanced in the 20s. Because they are condensed matter, they're essentially incompressible, but they have this lattice, and if you have a hexagonal planar lattice, like something like graphite, it's well known that graphite has intercalate regions where, so you have hexagonal planes, and then if you have non-carbon elements, like this is how a filter works, you'll take a little piece of graphite, you could saturate that graphite, if I put it on the table here, and I saturate it with other atoms, it'll get loaded up with those other atoms, and then when I touch the table, once it's saturated, those other atoms go from the solid phase to the gas phase, and the graphite can expand a hundredfold. So why does a star go nova? It's because we have lattice structure in the stars, and when that lattice structure is disturbed and atoms go enter the gas phase because they're not in an organized lattice, then the star expands. So it actually explains the formation of, of giants and novas very nicely because if you have many intercalate regions with many uh, atoms and then they, they slowly expand, you'll get a giant. So the giant has, uh, it has, so you'll get a G-class giant, that's a G-class star that went ahead and its intercalate zones expanded. So now the star becomes a giant. Okay, so of course it's a, it's a totally new way of looking at the stars, but, but one of the things is, the central idea is that the stars have lattice structure. They're not gases, and, and what you saw today is the great proof that stars are gases is invalid. It's a violation of thermodynamics. Whereas for, if you look at how do you form a star in a, in a condensed model, there there's no violation of thermodynamics, right? Because you can have a cluster that is formed and then atoms slowly adding to the cluster. So they're doing work on the cluster. You have two systems doing work. That's allowed, okay? But, in a, but if you have a single system and the, and the system collapses on itself, that is not allowed, okay? So thank you very much. Is there any other questions? Thank you very much.